So we're fortunate to have Rock Purdue football, Cobra Travel Soccer, for instance, and Hander Recreation seeking to use the field when they can get on it. And I think if you talk to these groups, um, there is certainly interest in continuing to do that. We also are sought after by groups such as the Maine Principals Association, and tonight we do have Mike Bisson here. Uh, he is now serving an executive director position with the MPA around uh, athletics, and he could speak to us, um, if you feel like that would be appropriate, around some of the requests that have been made. We've had 44 regional games that have been played on our turf, and we definitely are seeking to have more. Revenue generation is certainly a very strong aspect to our turf usage and replacement. And we feel like being sought after as a venue for comp competitive sports and regional play is important. And we want to make sure that we're actually growing that. Mike, would you have any comments around that? Sure. <coughs> Even in the room, eh? So, um, I'm actually responsible for soccer, and my partner, uh, Mike Burnham, is a field hockey person for the Maine Principal Association. We've hosted a number of championships over the years here on uh, Path when I was the athletic director and prior to that. This year, knowing that the turf was starting to break down, we stuck, went around and looked in this area because we usually do a, a southern championship and a, and a northern. We kind of alternate each year with those. Uh, soccer is every year because you put two classes in the north and two classes in the south. But we knew that we needed to explore other options if, if something wasn't going to happen with the turf. So we went around throughout this part of the state uh, from Colby up to, to Maine and knowing there's not, no other facility until you get the press call that has a, a turf field. And we really desire to play our championships at that time of the year, late, in, you know, early November, late fall, um, on a turf field. We used to play them on grass and it became such an issue. You'd have snow and then you're playing a championship in the mud. Um, the things that we look for is, do we have a way to control the gate? So is there fencing and, a, and limited access points? Uh, is there enough seating for everyone? Is the school willing to host us? Um, unfortunately, the folks in Hamden have always been willing to step up and do that. And we can't find another facility in this part of the state. So what that means is now that Meselonski is getting a, a new turf field, Colby's redoing their facilities, the northern might be in the Waterville area. Um, and, and this is a really important thing for us because we love to have this stuff up in this part of the state, especially when we have county teams coming down and, and down east teams playing in those uh, Class C and D championships. It's just a great place for them to not have to travel to Portland every year to play those. Um, I don't know if there's any questions anybody would have with regard to the MPA, but I'd certainly be willing to answer those. So an important fact here is that revenue generation is important. And our field since 2004 has generated $21,000 in revenue from rent. So we could certainly seek to grow that number. And I think with a new turf, it would be something that would be quite attractive, not just to the MPA, but potentially other um, competition interested groups. So here's a photo of our field course. Uh, we are seeing the fiber degradation, the wear spots, general hardening of the field, and sinking seams and lines. Um, this is an easier photo to see when you're looking at it from probably a smaller screen, but you can see the darkening wear patterns, um, especially we'll see in front of the goal areas, um, off to the sides and in the softball areas. Uh, that, Hardening is certainly in the black indicative of the infill. If you are a student athlete, I'm sure you've gone home with pieces of the turf in your shoes and on your socks, and every mom that's doing the laundry or dad um, is finding the same thing, and that's just part of the breakdown. Here are some close ups. You see in the first photo here on the left, there's the seams that are coming apart. We're seeing the degradation. <coughs> And then you'll see the first four photos on the left are the current condition of our field and the Lincoln Complex at Hudson, they have a brand new turf. And that is the difference in how the field looks. And you can see the vibrance of the fibers on that Lincoln Complex field. And that's what we would strive to have for our students as well. 
Also, we are looking to replace the stone that is around the perimeter of our current turf right now. Uh, we are finding that that uneven surface is a challenge for athletes when they're going off the field, whether they're racing after a ball or whatever might occur. So we want to improve safety in that aspect too. Before we have the students start to speak, I want to talk about the timeline because uh, one thing I've certainly heard uh, that would be a critique of how our issue 22 has come into this is why are we suddenly hearing about this? We've known about this for quite some time. And I'd like to point out that in August 2003, yes, the turf was installed and certified. In 2009, there was a field reserve fund established because there was discussion about the fact we will need to replace this asset someday. How are we going to start moving toward that? The way that uh, the methodology was pulled together was let's take 50% of gate receipts that are coming out of athletic events. And the athletic events that we charge for in our issue 22 are <coughs> soccer, football, field hockey, ice hockey. And those uh, funds have, would go into the general fund and support the HA directly, and 50% went into our field reserve fund since 2009. In October 2012, the athletic committee began discussions of replacement of the turf in earnest. And in October 2017, which is just recently this fall, we convened the athletic <coughs> committee and the building committee and decided to make a move to have the replacement proposed to the committee. So our timeline uh, that we present to you tonight is that here you are. Thank you again for coming. Tuesday, February 6th, we will be calling for a referendum in all four towns. And you would be posed with the question, would you be willing to fund uh, through bonding for a 10-year loan up to $850,000 for not only turf replacement but also uh, lighting <coughs> upgrade. And we're going with an up-to figure because we want to be sure that we're asking for an amount that we feel would be adequate to do this right. But also we want to be fair that we don't have the exact amount. So we want to be sure that if it comes in low than 850 that we're able to extend that to the community. If indeed we have a positive referendum, we would move forward on the 14th of February to apply to the main bond bank. The main bond bank funds twice a year and they do collective bonding so that we are able to seek uh, funding uh, with quite a low interest rate. The prior main bond bank uh, loan payout was in November and loans were put out at 2.2% interest. So I think uh, if we talk about money and borrowing being cheap, it feels like now is a time to move on this type of a project. May 21st, the main bond bank would distribute funds if we are indeed approved, and we're working with all four towns to get application materials together now, and every town has been wonderful to help us. And in July and August, we are hopeful to have an athletic turf installed so that the fall season is ready to roll on new turf. So at this time, I'm going to um, ask that our community members and students specifically start us off to share some perspectives about their experiences on the field. And then we'll be sure to turn to some discussion about funding, budget, and some aspects of the project that you might like to know about specifically. Is there a student who'd like to start us off? Hi, I'm here for uh, girls soccer, talking a little bit about our experiences with the turf. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that this turf has hosted 44 um, regional and state events. And that's not only a big event, um, money-wise for Hamden Academy, but it also brings teams together. Um, different teams from Hamden go to watch it together. And not only that, it brings people from all over the state. Uh, this year, the Northern Girls was hosted in Portland, and I know myself and a lot of my friends traveled to Portland to watch that. 
And so when we have that here, that's going to be people from Portland coming to Hamden Academy to watch those games here. Um, another thing for our teams here is that having this turf brings in a lot of other people. Um, this summer, for our summer sessions, the furthest we had to travel was Herman because all of the teams that wanted to scrimmage us in the preseason wanted to come here to play on our turf instead of us going to play on their fields. So that's pretty awesome when we don't have to travel, we don't have to do buses, we don't have to worry about any of that. It's all right here. And that also gives us the opportunity to host tournaments. Um, I know our girls and boys soccer team host play days. Um, we bring in a lot of teams from all over and it's a good opportunity to, uh, opportunity to kick off the season, uh, bring people in, and just play a lot of good soccer. Um, the turf also works as an advantage for us. Um, not many teams get to play on a turf, and if they do, a lot of it's just for practice. None of the soccer teams that we play against get to play on a turf for their home field. So they're not used to the pace of play. They're not used to how fast the ball moves on a turf. And that gives us a big advantage when, you know, maybe they're playing the ball too far out of bounds or it just takes them maybe a half to catch up to how fast the ball moves. That applies to field hockey. That applies to softball when it bounces faster. So that's a big advantage for us. And obviously you saw the lines. The safety of that is becoming an issue. The ball could stop on the line. So that's pretty important. And the last thing I want to talk about is um, when I travel to my other teams and we talk about soccer and you know, our favorite experiences of the season, a lot of my teammates on a couple teams I play for are from the Brunswick area or the um, Waterville area. And all they can talk about when we go is how much they love playing at hand and how much they love our turf. And I think the new turf would just really help and just have a lot of fun playing soccer and other sports. before we are one of the only schools with turf in this area so being the only um, school with turf in this area um, surrounding towns kind of look forward to playing at Hampton, at Hampton Academy because it's like a different experience to play on and we it always makes us proud to host um, playoff games for several sports even if it's not our own school because um, as a school and as students not only do we enjoy playing on the turf we also enjoy watching other teams have the chance to play on So I am going to talk about some more specific things um, regarding the uh, damage of the turf and deterioration. Um, so when the ball hits the southern lines on the field, um, it can bounce in different directions, which makes it dangerous for the person receiving the ball. Um, this affects both, both those sports I play on the turf, field hockey and softball. Um, since the turf has lost its, lost its shock absorption, when a player takes a hard ball, it can, it can result in increased con concussions and other serious injuries. Um, around the bases on the softball field, there are dangerous raised areas because um, they used to have dirt in place of them. Uh, as a third baseman, I have to um, play in front of this raised area, um, making my reaction time limited. And also, um, if I go to move back on a ball, I can catch my foot on that and it could make me stumble during a play. Um, the rocks around the turf are a safety hazard for players of the sports whose boundaries are closer to the edge of the turf. Um, if I'm trying to go for a foul ball near the dugout, um, I, may, I may stumble on the rocks because they are um, very loose and they're different size. Um, this could re result in a uh, very bad injury because I could hit my head on the retaining wall or the railings of the dugout. Thank you. <laughs>
transition over to uh, talking to some community members who may have some questions. Yeah, um, most of the stuff I was going to speak about has already been mentioned, but I'll be talking on behalf of the Hamden County Boys Soccer Program. Uh, so the first time I was able to step foot on the turf uh, wearing a hands on Academy uniform and play my first game was a really incredible experience for me and I'm sure for a lot of the boys I was playing with. Um, I'm very, very proud of the sports facilities we're privileged enough to have here at Hamden Academy. Um, and I think that in order for future generations to have the same experience and feeling that I had, replacing the turf would be a great, a great option. Um, not only would student athletes or gym classes who get to use the turf benefit, but I think that the community as a whole would benefit greatly um, because no matter if you're young or old, anyone can go down, kick a ball around, have a little fun, uh, and make memories to last a lifetime. Um, you know, and finally, I want to say that I think replacing the turf would bolster the pride of not only our student body, but the community as well. So I've, I've actually had the pleasure to kind of like play on it for a long time and like see the quality of it. And it's awesome to play football on it. Game plays faster, it's just a really great experience and I know a lot of other teams don't get this experience to play on the turf. And when they do come, they are especially honored and, not, and um, they have a good time with it. So we use it for practices and um, over the past couple seasons, especially last season, I kind of seen it deteriorate in quality. Um, the surface become, has become harder, and then there's these little rubber pellets. I'm sure everybody who plays and knows what I'm talking about. They get stuck everywhere, clothes, shoes, they have um, water bottles, equipment, you know, pretty much everywhere. And um, I've noticed that when the turf is wet, this is especially prevalent. You can see the clumps where it is, um, has gathered, and you can see that in the stands or on the playing field. And the surface itself has become a lot harder, which is very noticeable playing football is tend to be on the ground a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, I think a new turf would be great for football. Um, I know I would appreciate it, and anybody who plays on the football team would tell you that it would be very appreciated. And also, I know a lot of guys on the team want me to tell you, purple turf would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you guys decide. I actually don't need a mic. Um, my name is Paul Wellman. I actually am the girls soccer coach. And before we move to the question, I just I wanted to bring your attention to something that we might not always think about. Um, yes, we heard about injuries that are pretty serious in nature, but with a wife who's a physical therapist and having played collegiately, I know that that turf's hardness is really hard on our players knees-wise, shins-wise. And while it starts small, those issues in today's world become more prevalent. And we see more and more knee injuries and with the turf, what it offers is in the beginning of our season where it's predominantly dry in the grass, that's going to be softer. Um, when it's too soft and that risks rolling ankles and injuries, that stays firmer. And so it becomes, if it's new and working like it should, something that's safer for our players and that I don't have to continually safeguard against as much. Because we do probably the first three, four weeks of conditioning really just trying to prevent shin splints even higher level than what we would normally do because of the hardness of the turf. So I just wanted to get that out as well. Thank you. I have a question to follow up to that, actually. Uh, first of all, I'm in favor of this project. Um, my question, and I've talked to Heath a little bit about this, is the, uh, 
regarding injuries, has the school looked at a shock absorption, shock absorption pad that is placed under the field? Um, as a father of two six-year-olds that are very athletic, and I pretty much will, they'll be on those fields in 12 years when the field's starting to wear down. Uh, such things as those injuries is my concern. Uh, having worked on similar projects, I know the, a pad was applied in the, at the Hassan project that you, that you uh, indicated. Um, that pad is, helps keep the rating of the uh, concussions down and so forth. So uh, my uh, question is, has that been looked at? And can you explain why or why not? So uh, yes, we have uh, looked into padding, but we've also looked into infill. And one relationship that we've uh, been educated on is that uh, while shock padding is often something that is quite uh, politically correct to speak about, you can get the same effect oftentimes by the depth of your infill and making sure you're making a quality choice around that. So I'm gonna introduce someone to us um, who is our resident expert around this and is helping guide us in this decision. And his name is Blaine Buck. He is our owner's representative from Corja Company. And I'll let him chat with you about this very issue. Hi, good evening. So, um, shock pads. Uh, shock pads are, uh, for all first, let me introduce you. So I'm, I'm Blaine Buck from Corja Capital Projects Group. Uh, we, do, we do a significant amount of fields, um, artificial turf fields around the world. We pretty much have the exclusive contract with FIFA World Cup Soccer, so we designed and or constructed or consulted on fields pretty much in every continent uh, and around the world. Um, shock pads are, are a discussion that um, I really don't know if we've got to the point of saying do we need a shock pad or we don't need a shock pad on this particular field. But I do know is in high school play we rarely see shock pads. We see shock pads, for instance, in the collegiate um, and certainly in the, in the pros. Um, recently, uh, Boston University, um, there wasn't a shock pad put down, by, by example, because some of the turf, some of the, some of the th third or fourth generation turf now have the infill product. They actually give what, give that, uh, that G, it's called the G-Max, G-Max force. It's the force of, of, the, of the absorption of the force in the field and back upon the student athlete. You still get the same amount of G-Max protection over the lifetime, 12 years to 15 years on a, on a new turf field. So um, as my discussions with, uh, with Regan and the superintendent and others, um, uh, we really haven't fully got to the point of deciding on a shock pad or not, um, but there's some advantages and disadvantages, but we're seriously, seriously having that conversation. Just a follow-up question, then. if you're at that point, have you really narrowed it down to a certain type of turf? You're exactly right. So, so the answer the answer is no. Um, uh, even though we we we've talked about it, uh, our recommendation is to uh, is to go to a request for qualification for turf manufacturers. Um, years ago, um, we would we would prefer taking and doing an RFP and allowing vendors to actually come in and tell us or show us the turf they like to put in. There's so many different varieties and versions these days. We like them to, to we like to pre-qualify them and then actually bring them in to give us the advantages and disadvantages of their of their turf products. And in that, some of them will say, let's put a shock pad in and let's go with the inch and a, inch and a quarter turf. And some will say, no, we don't need any. Let's go with the two, two and three quarter inch uh, turf and uh, an infill product. Uh, I have another follow-up question regarding the uh, drainage that there's been a high process on, on the current field, or is there expected to be done, or is that going to be part of your analysis phase when you go out today? Uh, well, we have talked a, you know, a lot about the drainage. We've been to the site three times now. Um, it looks like it's drained quite well. We understand that um, that Sargent uh, Corporation actually did the field, which is quite frankly the, the, the best. I just uh, finished a field at. Um, uh, RSU 57, uh, Massabisa, um, and they were the vendor of choice there. And it appears that the drainage is working appropriately all the way around the field. Um, we, we are gonna have that discussion. Uh, we, we are looking to bring in a, a, another site engineer at this point to take and look at drainage as, as well as some other aspects of, of the hardness on the field. Without 
uh, shock pad at all. It's just a, a sample. And this is not necessarily representative of the product that we will go with. It just simply is a sample that was given to us by a vendor. Other questions? I'm wondering, I'm, I'm not very familiar with turf grass, so I'm just wondering, when we're talking about some of these shock absorbencies, can you compare it to just regular grass? Is there any shock absorbency that comes from regular grass versus turf? Uh, grass is the best shock absorber you can have, believe it or not. Okay. What we find is if you, if you, can, if you can maintain a grass field, um, in an appropriate state, it's it's better than any artificial turf. Artificial turf gives you advantages that that, that grass doesn't. Obviously, you know you can you know, length of play, uh, time of year, you can be on the field longer, um, uh, maintenance. Uh, all there's there's just a number of benefits for that. But in our experience, and I'm, we're very honest, if if you have a very good grass field um, from a shock absorbency standpoint, and it was built correctly, it's the best field you can. I, I have other questions, but I'm certainly willing to let other people jump in. Um, because you brought up the top of the grass field, I would like to uh, show a slide. And I don't know if you have additional questions about that or not. I do. Okay, maybe this would. Sure. Um, we all understand is that the turf is allowing us to play four sports on one field where a grass field is highly unlikely to be able to do that. So we have had um, a situation where we've been able to ask for someone to give us uh, an estimate of what it would cost for the maintenance of grass fields. <coughs> First of all, I need to say that we would need to construct the four grass fields. So we would be looking, of course, to pull the turf up, and that would potentially be one location for a grass field. But then we would be looking for additional location. Um, for all of the items that you see in the box, from mowing to the insect management on the fields, the soil sampling, the painting of the field lines, um, and all the labor costs involved in this, we'd be looking at an annual maintenance cost for four fields, not one four fields of $67,235 a year. If we took that out, of course, over a 10-year cycle, because that's what we're asking for the loan of the replacement turf, we'd be looking at a cost of about $670,000. What's the cost of income? What, what's your current cost? Infill for? Adding to your current turf. Oh, oh, our athletic care. Um, yes. The grooming for the current turf field right now, we're paying about $2,000 a year, and that's for a brushing regimen. Uh, we know that in our next uh, field replacement, we will be having a maintenance regimen that we'll need to be following. And so we'll be looking to see how we can be provided some of that uh, through service contract or warranty even, or looking at what we would need to do to do that in-house also. Is the infill being added to the other turf fields at this time? Yeah. Or yeah. It's just Any other questions before? Does the district own the property today to construct new fields if we wanted to? No. Or that would be an additional cost? We would need to find the land available to actually construct the fields. In the meantime, of course, to construct uh, four new fields, uh, we don't have a timeline on that. If that could not be done in a, uh, a timeline to be available for the seasons to open, we'd also be looking at transportation and potential leasing costs to have field availability for the sports that we couldn't play until the construction was done. Hi, 
I'm Julie Cody from Bronco Youth Football. And uh, just to start out, of course, Bronco Youth Football is definitely in support of replacing uh, the turf. And we don't practice on the turf. Uh, we don't uh, use the turf for all of our games, but we do call the turf our home field. And our home field uh, is on you know Sunday afternoons, our weekend games. But what the turf does for us for the youth sports is it allows us and our families and what we call our Bronco football family to come out and bring our competitors here to Hamden and allows the kids to use the turf, but it also allows us, we play an eight game season, no games during the week, no night games, hopefully, unless we're making up because someone can't play on a grass field. So when you only play eight games, before the snow flies, before playoffs for your high school teams, before your, you only have a very short window. So all these schools in all of these towns want to play here. They want to play our teams. Our Bronco youth football signups over the last six years have been an, an increase in numbers year over year. We've had great seasons. Our coaching staff have increased, our parent involvement has increased, our injuries have decreased, our budget has increased, and our kids are having a good time. We're lucky enough, if you wanna know who's gonna play on the turf for the next eight to 10 years after you replace it, they're here. <laughs> they're here, they're right here. These are them. I'm lucky enough that I also have one going into high school. Uh, next year I'll have one going into Reedsboro. And, you know, they're, they're truly the kids that are going to be utilizing this field. And it's easy for me to say because obviously, you know, I'm a football coach. Obviously I love it being a football field. And when you see the goalpost, you think football field. But it being used for four other sports. But there's a couple other things that weren't listed on your slides. We had a rainy Little League season. We played four downpour games for Little League Baseball on the turf. We were lucky enough to do that. When you have games that are just washed out, if you don't get those games in, at the end of your season, you're playing four games a week. When they're 10 years old and you're playing four games a week, not only are they tired, but as parents, we don't love it. <laughs> I don't love it at all. Um, but I'm just telling you, like those are the aspects of having a turf. Not only the student experience, but also the parent involvement. You know, to be able to get your games in, to be able to also keep your schedule. There's something to be said about a schedule that stays the schedule. To be able to get out there, have your kids on the turf. The turf is in rough shape. It's hard it's crumbling, it's falling apart. Um, it's all of the things that they said. Um, I've, over the last couple of days, have received some, a lot of questions from a lot of parents and a lot of people that are, aren't necessarily questions that I should be answering, you know, that are, that are questions that people wanna ask, you know, why does it have to be a multi-purpose field? We have all these fields. Oops. To put in this kind of money to not have it multi-purpose, I mean, it's not realistic. It's a multi-purpose field. It's for the community to share, even though it has goalposts. But, and we understand that. And the whole point is it to be able to allow, if you have four sports or five sports that share this, to be able to utilize this, you give all the other access to all the other fields. You be able to people have practices right after school less transportation, you, it, it lines it up so there's other fields available for people to give more home games. It really does have a benefit. So I know there's been some questions of, are, you know, why, why do we have to share it with so many sports? And that really shouldn't be a concern because there is really a lot of benefit by having it be a multi-purpose field. And also for us, for the younger kids, and I know it's younger. There was something to be said about coaching some kids all the way from rec flag football until they're about to go on to the middle school team. 
and we play on a donated practice field and to be able to bring them across the field, across the street to a middle school game and to be able to have them watch a middle school game under the lights and to bring able the team over all together to support a middle school game and to show them that just because we're not your coaches anymore, like we're still involved. Like we are still going to be here to support you. You're still Broncos and we're still all together is something to be said. So I know it's just a field or it's just her for it's whatever you might think it is, but for us and for them, it's different because it's really kind of like where that's where we meet. It's where we kind of are growing our sport and it doesn't matter if it's football or field hockey or soccer. It's kind of where we like all come together from the younger age groups, even to your high school, your seniors. It's kind of where we kind of bring all together our sporting families. We're only bringing in 21,000 since 2004. What are those initiatives? that we have. We actually would like to uh, make sure that people leave tonight understanding that we have um, methods for both this field that's coming <coughs> up and then the subsequent replacement that would happen in 12 years. Uh, maybe we will get 15 years from it. We're, we're hopeful. Uh, what's important to know is that for the current uh, field replacement, we are looking at uh, Public referendum of up to 850,000. We also have the dedication of the field maintenance reserve fund up to 110,000. But we already have an application uh, in to have uh, potential grant funding, and we also have uh, another three foundations that we are actively now uh, pursuing the applications for for some substantial uh, grant funding, if possible, and in, in the definite thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. We also know that naming rights are something that our district needs to continue to investigate and capitalize on. Right now we're calling it the turf. And there is a name out there that could be quite attractive to either a potential donor, an organization, uh, a, a business, if the uh, naming aligns with our naming rights uh, policy that we have in our district because we want to be sure that we're doing so in a manner that actually preserves our community base and really affects the values that we expect to have in RSU 22. But for our current turf replacement, this is our, our plan right now. For the future turf replacement, we have uh, the continuation of the field maintenance funds we have already started an athletic signage campaign. If you've been out to uh, one of our basketball games, as of late, we have released the documents. We have multiple signage venues on our athletic campus that we would like to uh, seek sponsorship for and offer people the opportunity to put up their business sign and have great art advertising and marketing right here in RSU 22. <coughs> we feel the potential revenue of this is absolutely greater than $100,000 a year. 
It's a matter of us getting the marketing right and making sure we're speaking to the people who would have that vested interest in RSU 22 for years to come. We also are right now in a review phase of an annual service contract that would have an annual payout to the district. And we're intending that uh, a portion of that revenue, if not all, that will be decided upon review and through our finance committee work and our school board. But uh, that could be another revenue stream and that's in the thousands of dollars as well. We will continue to pursue the grants um, that we're looking at for this current turf replacement, but also for the future uh, replacement as well. And the naming rights will continue to be there because if the naming rights for one venue are taken most immediately, we will have other venues that we would be uh, giving options for as well. So we hope that those um, efforts will certainly result in being much closer to the target figure than we are right now. Go back to the slide or no if okay. you need to yep. so <coughs> first of all let me preface this by saying i'm in support of the sports programs okay. okay and i'm definitely in support of safety but i have some questions about the history of how this happened okay. so in 2003 i'm assuming some of you are aware of yes. how it went down yes there was no planning at all at this time for the fact that like like what you're doing now is what was not done in 2003 planning for the second field not done? Planning for a second field? Yeah, like what we're doing now. We're the talking about getting a new field. one in, and we're saying 15 years from now, we're going to need another one. When the one went in in 2003, was there, hey, 15 yes, years from now, was what was the plan then? What was the plan? It just didn't. So, no. Um, I'm glad you brought up the history because um, I was fortunate enough back in 2003 to be part of this multi. Um, field vision. We happen to have some community members, Danny Lafayette and Herb Sargent, who felt very strongly that they wanted this to happen. And without any funding at all from anyone other than parents and those two corporations, we were able to make this vision a reality. And we talked extensively back in 2003 about taking 50% of the um, gate revenues, and I'm happy to see that it actually happened because um, we were questioning that, but it took six years to get there. We also, um, it's great that other, it's great to have a lot of community pride and our students being able to use it and offering it to other communities, but we also have to be aware that there's a cost associated with that and that we do need to ask for rental and I wasn't sure that that was happening so it's although it's it's disappointing that we only have 21,000 after this will be the 16th season that that field is in use um, but we did talk a great deal about that and we were very concerned because it was only parent um, like we all signed five years, you either give 500 a year or 100 a year or 50 a year or whatever you felt you could afford. And we did have that concern. And, you know, looking back, it would have been nice if we had had community and support back then so that we wouldn't be facing this. But I do, the naming rights, I'd like to see it named Lafayette uh, Sergeant for at least a year. Because, <laughs> 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 yeah. So um, back, back to your point, uh, I yeah. think we do acknowledge that we didn't have a plan in place uh, for where it was going and until 2009 we didn't have it off the ground. We definitely look back in history and see we don't want to repeat that. And so I think we have vigorous efforts right now to get a plan in place that's actually sustainable. That's the word we want to use. Right. So the numbers that you're putting up there as far as the receipts I mean, the interest on an $800,000 loan over 10 years, even at 2.2, is probably $300,000. So the MPA reimbursements as well as gate receipts won't even cover that. So we're, we're basically, we're paying for the whole thing. And again, I'm in support, I'm, not, I'm just saying, be realistic about the numbers we're talking about. 
There's nothing that's going to sugarcoat that in the word pain. So you, I, and I'm just saying the numbers are 100,000, 200,000. So sure. 1.1 1 .1 million would be the, the term that you would pay over 10 years. All I would want to add, and I, I certainly have to say you're exactly right. I cannot guarantee this, but if grant funding does come to fruition or the signage campaign gets good leverage, and I think it will take a couple years for the signage campaign to get the leverage, um, I, I do think Those we will have considerable offset. Too. What's that? The numbers of $100,000 in logo revenue. Do you uh, have actually, we have uh, uh, identified. Sure. Um, I'll get my resource right over here. Great. I don't have a slide on this, so forgive me. I'm going by paper. Uh, what we have is uh, the active signage campaign. We have uh, a number of slots for different levels of sponsorship. So we have uh, <clears throat> we have five uh, sponsor slots that are. The asking sponsorship is $3,000 for each of those slots annually. We also have a two-year and a three-year option for those slots. We have up to 46 platinum sponsor slots, which are $2,500 annually. We have um, 18 slots um, that are 2000 and I could go on and on with this, but as you see, I mean, there are, are so many potential slots that that figure actually I've I've run the numbers multiple times to be sure if it comes to fruition at that level we will be in good shape in the next 10 years and that raises the question of do we want logos all over our phones? yes it does um, I'll tell you what what we've done we've sent a small team to go to South Portland they initiated this model and we were invited down to go see what it looks like because that very question was one of the primary issues. And when our uh, New Hamden Academy was built, the naming rights and the uh, advertisement signage policy was put into place because we did not want that. Uh, actually, the way South Portland has laid theirs out is, is relatively attractive and it gives um, the advertising space that is along a fence line. It's not necessarily creating a new <coughs> space where you'd be putting something uh, that isn't already present. So I think that we've tried to follow that model and we've done mock-ups with photographs um, to just look and sample what it would be like. And I think it would be something that would be tolerable to the community. And do those placements, back, those are the numbers that you have. Yes. Like if I was spend $3,000, Non-intrusive. Correct. I'm not paying 3, unless I am. So yes, we actually <coughs> have a description of, of exactly where you'd be, and um, okay. yes. The timeline's tight for fall for placement of the field. Yes. What's the backup plan if this is running behind schedule for fall? <coughs> That's a great question. <coughs> Well, we're very hopeful that with the way the bond bank funding would work, we would be underway right after school gets out. Now, if we were to run significantly behind <coughs> schedule, uh, the timeline right now, we don't have it completely in stone, but we're hopeful to have it completed so that pre-season practices can start. So we would have a few weeks where we'd have to be moving practices. We probably could do some on our campus and changing fields um, that we're currently using for other uh, reasons into what we need. We would be probably having to look at moving a couple of sports and potentially asking other communities. But I'll let um, Blaine speak to Timeline and Fred, our athletic director, speak to um, what they're thinking about that. That's fine. So I'm pretty relaxed on the schedule. 
um, this is a replacement. Um, usually, if this, if this was, we have schools that we're going to start probably next month, the design process to actually have it ready for um, August 8th. Um, uh, so, from a schedule standpoint, RFQs will go out for the lighting and the field. Um, RFQ for the lighting, um, RFP for the for the excuse me, RFP for the lighting, RFQ for the field turf um, in February. Um, interviews March, April. Um, everything is fine. Contracts uh, sometime at the end of April, um, with a uh, beginning point um, on something like I think it was June 15th, because the last day of school is the 12th, a la uh, snow days. And, um, and being completed by August, August 8th. Um, we've run this by several, several different companies. Um, they're all fairly relaxed on this also. Um, I'd be a little more concerned if this was a, if we were gonna dig the field up and we were putting all new sub-base drainage permits. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's pretty straightforward. If there was a, uh Potential uh, delay, it would most likely affect preseason practices and not game contests. So those, it would be a scheduling challenge, but we could move things around and still get preseason practices in. It wouldn't affect game uh, competition. Question on, what's the time frame on lighting? Great, so let me uh, pull up the slide on lighting. lighting specific slide but this is our proposed design plan we are interested in uh, improving field lighting and we're calling it a field lighting upgrade because we recognize that what we're going to be uh, prioritizing is replacement of the turf to the highest quality level that our community can afford we will then look at the athletic field lighting as a secondary improvement and we uh, recognize that what we'd like to be moving toward is LED replacement and uh, depending on the degree of the upgrade, we could be looking at $150,000 plus. We will be looking at this segment though in terms of the budget because we want to be sure that turf is the priority. <coughs> lighting is to, of course, bring some energy efficiency to the field lighting. Uh, you probably may know that we've been underway with an energy efficient project district wide where we have replaced um, lighting galore throughout our district. And we've already realized the savings from those LED replacements in our building, our street lights, parking lot lights, and so forth. Um, we also realize that on our field, the future bulb replacements for what is currently there is being phased out. So we're going to be challenged to find a means to replace those over time if we don't do something that is a significant upgrade. So I'm going to just give you a kind of a snapshot of how this is. We have 53 bulbs out on our field right now. 46 of those are used for fo football, soccer games, and field hockey. We have seven that are used for softball only. We've run the numbers on this. We are paying right now $147 for each lighted three-hour game. If we move to LED replacements, we'd be looking at paying $47 per each three-hour game. So that's $147 dollars of savings per game. We, pay, we play a little under 100 games a year on the field. So if we've got $100 a game times 100 games, we're looking at $10,000 a year. Over 10 years, we're about $100,000 of savings. We also know that the LED lights uh, have a warranty that will be quite considerable and their life will be substantial. So we're hopeful for this project because we do believe now is the time and we are in need of doing something because those bulbs are not going to last forever. 
We also have a dark area on our field. If you look down toward one of the end zones, toward the d dirt parking lot, it's just a, a dark area for play. So we want to be sure that we're having appropriate field coverage for all of our games. There's reduced um, maintenance on the LEDs, I assume. Um, right now, spending about $4,000 a year to replace about 10 bulbs annually in ballast. On, on the current lighting. Do you have anything to add, Blaine, about the lighting that you think would be important? I, I just, just that LEDs are just really, they're, they're, when you get into what you have now, they're starting to phase those out. And the, the joke around the industry is in 10 years, you're not going to be able to find a bulb except on eBay or, or you know, some other, some other method. Um, I don't believe, you know, it's going to be 10 years. It might be 15 years. Um, LED lights, you know, you're going to get a 25-year warranty. They're going to last up to 50 to 100,000 hours. Whereas the metal halide lights, you're, you're going to get 15,000 <coughs> to 25,000 hours out of those. The dilemma with the, the uh, metal halide is after, you know, after they're used uh, probably 1,000 hours, the light uh, efficiency goes down. It's called efficacy. It goes down. So it starts going to 90% and 80% and you start seeing dark spots around the field. Um, the other great thing about LED lights are they're instant on, instant off. They don't have to warm up, they don't have to have stripes, you don't have ballasts, and, um, and you do really neat things with them also. They're, you, you have different settings. So if you're out there with your maintenance crew, you set them on a 25% light. If you're out there with training, you set it on 50%. If you're on game day, you have them 100%. And then above that, you can do a bunch of other, you know, other things. Like I said, LED lights, I, you know, they're, they're really the way to the future. It's a generic question. For, uh, is there an average payback period on LED lighting that you've seen? Yeah, we see, it's kind of funny, when I came today, um, Regan and, and crew had run their numbers. Um, on average, you're, you're right on national average. Usually you run these lights 300 hours a year, and the savings is somewhere around $10,000 a year. And you're going to get 25 years out of them and so, you know, if you do the math, you know, it's, it's, it, it pays for itself through the service life of the, uh, of the site. Yeah. understand that uh, the need for four sports to be played on one field area is going to be prohibitive for a grass field. Due to our climate, uh, we're challenged to be out on grass fields in uh, central northern Maine uh, early at all, so this is an advantage for us with the turf. What happens if we don't replace the turf? It's an important concept for us to all leave with a, an understanding that uh, we'd like to have an analogy like the roof of the uh, shingles on your roof. We all know when we put shingles on a roof that they're only going to last for so long. And we certainly go through our lives and when we start to notice things or have a leak, we might do a repair. And then it gets to a point where you have to replace the entire roof. And that's where we are, our turf is buckling just like shingles on a roof that have been repaired. I think we've done a nice maintenance regimen to maintain it to 14 years, but it's time. We are concerned that if we go too far with pushing this, that we're going to face such severe deterioration that we won't be able to have students on the field because it won't be fit for play. And we want to be sure that when we have, as Brady brought up, football, 
We have students on the ground every play with football. That's the intention. And I think it's our obligation to be sure we're having children do that on a field that is uh, substantially resilient enough for them to do it safely, not to mention the shin splints and the knees. So uh, we certainly recognize that if we got to a point where we continued to evaluate the field and it was no longer safe for play, we would be making a transition to find fields elsewhere to utilize. And we would be looking at lease costs, transportation costs to do that, plus trying to find the availability. And I know that we really don't want our Broncos going to play in Bangor. <laughs> <laughs> So we'd like to ask you to join us if you're interested in a Facebook uh, effort just to get our stories out there, our photographs about the turf and its use over the past 14 years. It's had quite a history already and I loved uh, the information tonight that came out about how this came to be. I think it was Citizens for Quality Education was actually the name of the parent group yes. who came together and donated this field to us. And so um, we're going to start tonight to advertise hashtag turf22. If you have uh, those photographs, we'd like to get them up there so that the community is seeing what uh, we've had for history and the opportunity that our children have had. Not to mention the adults who uh, have enjoyed watching all of the kids play and their grandkids. So this is the referendum question that will be posed to you on February 6th. Uh, we would really like to ask that each of you uh, get out and vote, and no matter what your persuasion about voting yes or no, please encourage others you know to vote as well, because one thing we don't want to face is voter apathy. This is a, a one-time situation where I think we all can agree safety first, and we want to do this responsibly, and I do feel that the points that have been brought up about funding in the future are on our minds, and we're actually taking action on it. We already have. So I hope you can trust in us with that. Yes? Is there any consideration that future funding is just put in as a line item in the budget? Or are we coming right back to borrow money and get to Thank you for bringing that up. Every single year at the district budget meetings, we have two warrant articles that come up before us all. And that is to put money away in the field reserve account and the capital reserve account. Um, we have never had an experience that I'm aware of in the past uh, 12 years or so where someone has stood up and said, let's put more money into one of those articles. But we will be coming to the district budget meeting having discussed that a lot. Are the amounts adequate that we've been putting away? Should we be making recommendations that are higher? And how are we going to fund those if we do? Well, they're clearly not adequate. The numbers you put up there, that's not even close. <laughs> so, <laughs> Do you want me to bring it up? Maybe, maybe we'll come with a with a figure that is more in line with what we need. But if if you felt that way, please do. All right. Well, thank you for coming tonight. If you have further questions, just come on by and ask. Thank you.